Blog Talk Radio. The Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. The Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. Your hosts are here for the show tonight to interview our special guest. A show highlight the Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. The Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. Football, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, boxing, a tennis ball story. The Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. The Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. Tune in for all the news and scores. Reporting on the games and so much more. The Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Show. 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 Good evening, everybody. It is Friday, February 24th, 2023. My name is Aaron. I am one of the hosts of the Alan and Aaron Sports Talk podcast. Alan will be joining me here in just a moment. What a uh, hectic week we had, but that's in a good way uh, this week as uh, we wrapped up last weekend uh, all the races at Daytona. Of course, the Daytona 500 last Sunday. Alan's got some great information on that. He got a bird's eye view of it all, and now we're heading into some other sporting things that are going to be going on as the year through. And, of course, uh, we're going to have a lot of good conversation here about everything this evening. Alan, uh, good evening. I'm sure you're still a little tired from last week being at Daytona. How are you tonight? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. Really glad to to be one this, this evening with you. And, yeah, it has been a real hectic time here on the Allen and Aaron Sports Radio Show. That's That's an understatement right there. Hectic in a good way, though. I hope you took uh, some good uh, walking shoes over there. I know in just two days, I walked quite a bit. Didn't didn't quite walk 500 miles, of course, but uh, certainly got uh, some exercise. Yeah, I definitely did. Um, it was a lot of, man, lot of steps. What, yeah. <laughs> definitely definitely got your steps in, for sure, for the week, probably, in those couple of days that you were over there. So, um but no, what a great uh, atmosphere. Um, you and I were absolutely enamored uh, to be there. I know you were there last year, so this wasn't your first rodeo, so to speak, but um, just a great time. Um, really, really exciting. And we'll go into more depth on that here, uh, you know, in a little bit. I uh, want to also thank tonight our excellent sponsor, Chef G's Florida Barbecue Sauce. So delicious and addicting. You may need a support group. And Alan, I know we've got a special guest with us here tonight. Uh, Take it away. Yeah, that's right. We have a special guest that's going to be Anthony Bristol. And, you know, Anthony really helped me out a lot. He's a professional photographer, and he was at the Daytona 500 with me. You know, he's the chief and founder of Racing History Today magazine. So you could also find him at Bristol underscore images. And you can definitely check him out. He's a, definitely a, a great photographer. He's done such, such great work that really helped me out during the Daytona 500. In fact, what ended up happening was there were some times where there was a time in particular where I couldn't actually get to take the new generation car. He went ahead and did it for me because it was just a lot to, to do. And that's Bristol, be, just like the... Bristol, Connecticut, Bristol underscore images one, and it's Bristol underscore images one. We have the great Anthony Bristol joining us here. In fact, let's bring him on right now. Hey, how's it going, Alan? How are you doing tonight? Pretty well. How about yourself? How are you doing so far this evening? 
Oh, very well. And, and hey, thank you so much for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. It really means a lot to me. Oh, we're so glad and honored to have you join us and so delighted that, you know, you've been doing such great work about your photography that people get a chance to hear about it. So how did you first get started into taking photography professionally? Oh, man. Um, well, professionally, um, I, I'd have to go back and, you know, and go back to when I was, a, you know, a little kid. And I've always actually had a uh, a passion for photography, you know, um, what what would end up happening is my grandmother would take a lot of family photos and I'd take, you know, her, you know, point and shoot. And the, of course, at that time it was film, but I'd take pictures of the cat and, you know, just goofy stuff or whatever. But, but even back then I, I knew that, that those were going to be important later in life, you know, having those memories to cherish, you know, for whether it's our family or myself or whoever, but then, you know, just time goes on and, what, and whatnot, you know, um, you know, things change. And then, it, you know, it really came to one day that, um, at the time, my my mother was dating a race car driver, and he was just coming out of a um, a ten year retirement. And I, you know, he's just he's still a good friend of mine. His name is Sean Freeland out of Scottsville, New York. And I said, Hey, Shawnee, you know, if you're coming out of retirement, you need a photographer. And he said, You know, it's probably a good idea. So, you know, I think he did you know two or three races, and that was in 2010. And I showed him. He's like, Man, and to quote him, he's like, You 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 really take some badass shots. He's like, Keep doing this, and I just ran with it. Wow, that's this. It was something meant to be, and and now you're taking photos at the Daytona 500. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's. Oh, well, let me let me, let me tell you that there, there was a lot of a lot of work and a lot of heartache in between all those times to, to get to the Daytona 500. And, you know, it, it took me about 13 long hard years of a lot of dedication, a lot of work to to get to be able to get to uh, the the Daytona 500 for sure. Wow, I didn't know that. So. It took you over 13 years for you to get the media and access to go ahead and take professional photography to Daytona 500. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, I, I and so you know when, when I was photographing Mr. Freeland, you know, starting out then that that you know local dirt dirt racing, and then you know did that for a couple of years, and then eventually I got um, <laughs> I, I um. I was I went down to Watkins Glen because I just joined the Sports Car Club of America and um, they give out it's called a hard card and you know I was still so new to club racing and so I ended up going to a Trans Am race not knowing that's a professional race and I couldn't get in well thankfully someone was there from our club and they kind of got me in and then you know introduced me to this to this you know this kid there and then um that night I, I ended up at a place called the international motor racing research center which is located in downtown Watkins Glen, new york and um uh, a gentleman by the name of jc arkinsinger um inter- you know you know met me and um invited me to be his his guest at this party they were having and i wasn't even supposed to be there and one thing led to another and and then uh, made made a lot of great connections at, at the international motor racing research center and it's still a great, great organization. There's a lot of history there too. Yeah, in fact, you've done some great work with them. Talk about the work you've done with the International Racing Center. Yeah, so um, I, I started up there at, at 2015 as a volunteer, um, just kind of helping helping them archive um, a lot of like you know they have uh, full runs of um, oh man, just different periodicals throughout the years. Um, you know, uh, newspapers, magazines, um, anything, but, but, you know, that takes a lot of manpower to get those things, you, you know, uh, um, in chronological order and documented and whatnot. So I, I did that for a while. And then I said, you know, one day I said, Hey, um, you know, um, I know you guys request credentials at Watkins Glen, you know, I, I'd love to do that. And so they put me on one time and, and it just, and, I just kind of worked worked with that and, you know, did my time with uh, the Sports Car Club of America, too, on the side. And then, um, actually, um, the International Motor Racing Research Center at the time, and actually they still do, um, you know, monthly conversations. They had this one about um, the 1974 Can-Am Championship, was, which was the last year of that series. But um, it, it, it opened up a door to this uh, magazine called Victory Lane Magazine. So, um, you know, after after that conversation, and that was in November, I, I think it was in January, I called uh, Dan Davis, the editor of that, and I said, hey, you know, I'm uh, just starting out as a, you know, 
trying to get trying to get professional and um I'd like I'd like to do some stuff for you guys and he was kind enough to bring me on and that's how I kind of worked my way into into that you know in print media and um did did a lot of vintage racing as well and then wow. uh, through vintage racing it, it really kind of um pro racing as, as well yeah, and you and you do such a great job. And how was the Daytona 500 experience for you? Oh, for me, it was something out of this world. You know, I've been to <laughs> I've been to a, a lot of different um, you know different kinds of racing throughout my throughout my career so far. You know, different various IndyCar races, NASCAR, IMSA, um, dirt. But but I'll tell you, this Daytona 500, it was something. Just it was a spectacle. I mean, um, I, and I know you know, Alan, when uh, I mean, they had Dirk, Dirk Bentley performing the pre-race concert, and I just, my jaw dropped at the, just the sea of people at this, at the, uh, gathered at this infield. It was like, wow, it just, TV could not do it justice, let's put it that way. Yeah, it really was something great. Uh, that, that's fantastic. And, and for the people who don't know, you do some riskier shots, you take wide shots that you can actually combine into one, but the wide shots you take, you take it all the way in the roof. <laughs> yeah. So, so at the Daytona 500, I, I um, received a roof access sticker or a pass or unless you go out where the spotters are and there's a designated area for, um, for photographers. And so what I, what I essentially I'll do at, you know, what, what I did the Daytona 500 is I took a, what it's called a panorama and, um, and this is, and what a panorama is, it's a series of shots that are then stitched together to make one to make one photograph that's really wide or and you know a lot of, a lot of information and, and you know it, it just it shows a lot of information a lot of a lot of things going on, a lot of detail that's going on in, in one image that you would nor they that you would not normally get out of a traditional just single click image. That's fantastic. And, and, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, how did you get the roof access? <laughs> I, I, God. That's all I can say is God. <laughs> wow. Just, just blessed, you know. And I, you know, I just, I don't know. I, I really, you know, that's that's all I can say. <laughs> and for those who who haven't been on the roof, which I didn't even get roof access, how does it look up there when you get up there? It's it's pretty wild because I I didn't think there was a spot at Daytona where you could see the whole track, but on top of the roof, you can see you can see the whole track. It, it, it's it's hard to see the backside of the track, but you can see it. And um and obviously I didn't stay up there for the whole race. It was just you know for me it was more to get an overall land you know kind of like landscape panoramic shot of this of the whole layout of, of you know Daytona. But I mean, it was just an experience in of itself, just just to see that kind of bird's eye view that not many people do get to see. No, you're right. I did. Yeah, I did have roof access, so I didn't go up there. But that's <laughs> that's phenomenal. <laughs> that is incredible, and and uh, you know, a lot of people who who wish to go to Daytona 500 talk about the interaction you had with some of the drivers and just meeting some of the people. Um. I, I didn't really interact with too many drivers per se, unless they were at, at you know media day. I think that was well, Wednesday or was or whatever that was. We yeah, Wednesday, I think it was. Uh, well, anyways, but, but um, besides that, I don't. Really, I personally don't like to you know, you know, um, I don't know, try to be someone I'm not, or you know, try to try to budge in and barge in and whatever, whatever. But um, you know, from but from what I, from what I observed, everyone was very cordial. Every driver was very cordial to every everybody, the media, to every you know every fan they interacted with. Um, everyone everyone was on point. Um, and then um, as you know, as the week or yeah, as as the event went on, you know, on Sunday we there was a, a string of uh, press conferences with um, with some celebrities, so to speak. I know there was Charlotte Flair there. There was. Um, uh, who else was there? Um, Tiffany Haddish. There were so many people like, yeah, yes, yeah, Tiffany Haddish, and and and, and you know, I know you were there too. And, and man, her her press coverage just in of itself was a comedy show. I mean, she was great, just great. Yeah, she was. She was, and and you know, you guys are in for a real treat. We're gonna 
as soon as I get to it, I'm going to share that press conference with you guys. But yeah, Tiffany Haddish took the, she took the award home for the most entertaining press conference that I have actually have seen. Not that other ones weren't entertaining, but it was hard to top Tiffany Haddish. It really is. She's just so funny and so entertaining. She's on another level. Definitely stole the show in regards to press conferences, no question. I, and I do have to admit, I think that's the most entertaining press conference I've ever seen in the in the you know the twelve years I've been doing professional racing. Wow, yeah, you know, I mean, that was, that, <laughs> yeah, it, it was up. It was number one for me. I mean, not not again any dissing or putting down anybody else in their press conference, but it's just when you're dealing with a personality like Tiffany Haddish, who can lighten up a room and just funny and. It, you're right. I agree with you. It was the most entertaining press conference I have I have actually been in and actually witnessed. Yeah, it was it was phenomenal, and then it was it was also interesting too. Another press conference too was uh, Jeff Gordon, uh, Bill Elliott, and I can't remember the other gentleman's name that was there too. Um, just so many people there, but uh, that that was pretty interesting just to get different takes and different perspectives on the new Gen Seven car and you know what they thought and felt of you know the progression of you know how the cars have come throughout the years versus when they were racing and what to expect at this race before it happened. It, it was, it was neat. It really yeah, it was. wasn't. In fact, I, that was one thing that Anthony really helped me out on. I was just, you know, what do you have to do? What do you do when you need to be in two places at one time? You have a press conference, you're real hungry. You send your great professional photographer, Anthony, go do the pictures for you. <laughs> and at the unveiling of the new gen car, what did they say about it? Or did you catch anything about the information on it? Yeah, that was that. Well, from so what what that car they unveiled there was it, it, it's a car called Garage 56. Um, well, the Garage 56 project, and that is a car designed to run the 24 hours of Le Mans coming up here. And I think it's June. Someone can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm almost positive it's you know, early June, it's going to be running the 24 hours of Le Mans. But that was, um, from what I understand, a, a deal between Mr. Hendricks and um, I think Jim France had some kind of, you know, uh, inkling about that or he helped bring it along or whatever. And then I know, because I also went to the Rolex 24 and they introduced the driver lamp to, for that too, which off the top of my head, I can't remember. The only person I remember is Jimmy Johnson is in that driver lineup, which I think is very fitting being a seven-time champion. But the cool thing about this car is it, it looks like a Gen 7 NASCAR car, but it has it, it has working headlights. They're not stickers. Um, it, has a, it has a bigger spoiler. It looks a little wider. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more component, technical components in there that I probably don't even understand. But it, it, it's a really, really trick-looking car. And Anthony got a chance to catch the unveiling. I'll put those pictures up for you guys and so you get a chance to see it. And it's really cool. And that was a great experience for you to take those pictures. And with you got the you went to the Rolex, now to Daytona. What's next for Anthony? What are you doing next? Oh, my next race um, will be in mid March for the for the twelve hours of Sebring. And then also too, they'll have the WEC cars, which is the World Endurance Championship. And those are the cars that actually that run at Le Mans. For, and then it'll be their opener, and they'll, uh, their event's called the 1,000 Kilometers uh, at, at Sebring. Wow. So you got a lot of events coming up, and that's fantastic. You're keeping you busy. Very, very busy. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to trying to plug, you know, because I, you know, a little, little last year, uh, I had this idea, um, I don't know, April of last year to start this uh, this magazine called Racing History Today for the International Motor Racing Research Center because at the time we had some writers and, and photographers but not really a way to demonstrate their work. And I was like, well, we kind of need something to make us a little bit – we were already legitimate but a little more legitimate, you know, and, and on the media side of things. And it was just a great it, – it just killed a lot of birds with one stone, so to speak. You know, it was a great way to showcase photography, writing, um, just layout skills, um, you know, different kinds of racing, open wheel, you know, oval, road racing, what have you, you know, dirt racing, up and comers. It doesn't matter what it is, Concourse d'Elegance car shows. You know, um just just a just a way to, to showcase a lot of different things. Yeah, and that's and so, definitely great. And and so with with that, you know, I I 
it, it, it's one of those things. The more races you go to, the more content you, you can generate, and the more the more um, wider variety of things you can show people out there. And yeah, Anthony, tell us more about the magazine. Where could people check it out and pick up a copy? Yeah, so right now it, it is a uh, online only um, publication. It, it is totally free. So if anyone wants to go to, um, it, it, and it's hosted on the International Motor Racing Research website, which is www.racingarchives.org. And then when you go there, you'll uh, see um, a couple of tabs, but it'll be under news and events. And under news and events, it'll be the last tab, and it'll be racing history today. And that'll show. We we only have two issues out currently, but we're working on our third as we speak. And you click on the cover, and you can read the whole magazine. Wow, that's fantastic! And just in case you guys miss it, www.racingarchives.org. It's the news Correct. and events tab. Yes, right. It'll be under the news and events tab on their website. Yep. Click on that, and it'll show you the first two and you guys are working on the third one correct yep we have a small team right now of about three writers a layout person and two photographers and um you know <laughs> we need all the help we can get for sure and you know it, if anyone's out there listening that's interested the they can they can always shoot me shoot me an email at, at, at info at bristolimages.com and I'm, and I'm always looking for for people to help out that are, you know, willing to get their feet wet and want to try something new or maybe, you know, expand the horizons. Because, you know, I was when I was younger, I was always looking for a shot. And, you know, I finally got one. And, you know, I'm sure there's others out there like myself. That's right. In fact, that's info.bristol, B-R-I-S-T-O-L, images.com. Correct. Yeah, so yep. definitely that's right. Yep. So no, go yeah, ahead. No, it was just, yeah, going back to the you know just the whole weekend of the, of the five hundred. I mean, I I think all those those ladies and gentlemen, you know, drivers put on a heck of a show. You know, it, it, it kind of it was kind of a bummer that the that the truck race kind of you know got you know it stopped under you know red flag or rain you know. Right, it kind of rained itself out after a while, but you know, it, it was still great racing nonetheless. And you know, all the drivers, I mean, everyone, even at Daytona, you know, inter, you know, even at Daytona Speedway, every, everyone just hands down did a great job. And I, I can't commend everyone enough. They just did a heck of a job. No, I agree. Everybody that participated, volunteered, all the workers, the, the Thunderbirds, and it, it was just a oh, fantastic. That- it was fantastic. Yeah, them. Oh, that reminds me. That them Thunderbirds. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and yeah, for anyone who was there, I, I don't know what, what the TV broadcast caught, but that the the Thunderbirds were there, and they, the, the, the the traditional flower, but it was also an air show too. On top of it. Yeah, for those who didn't know that they didn't just fly over one time during the national anthem, they did come back and forth at least seven, eight times. They did, like you said, an air show, a mini air show. I never experienced anything like that at a race. You know, it was, it was wild. And, and them guys were flying real, real low too. I was like, wow, this is, this is cool. Yeah. It was just like, now I could see why the person in Top Gun got so upset when they fly so low with the noise because <laughs> it was loud. <laughs> it was real loud. Real loud. <laughs> and it wasn't just one it was five so and they were moving fast too yep and, and even even you know I, I think one of the press conferences too were, were the pilots if if I'm not mistaken of the Thunderbirds and, and even those ladies and gentlemen were, were just fabulous people they were that's, that's the great thing about the Daytona 500 is that it's just a great class of people you're absolutely right everybody did a fantastic job from the people who made the meals for the media, for people who volunteered, everybody collectively did a fantastic job, was very hospitable, very easy to talk to. I couldn't agree with you more. Everybody was great people like yourself, Anthony. It was just, it was just delightful weekend the entire time. It, it really was. And, you know, and, and, 
And, you know, I'll, I'll to be honest, you know, for at least for the listeners, you know, Alan, Alan and I have never, never met before this weekend. And that's one of the great things about, you know, going to, it's, it's not just the Daytona 500, but, but any race for that matter is part of the media. You meet a bunch of great, you know, you know, ladies and gentlemen there that have share the same passion. It may, may not even be racing. They just might like the media side of things, but it all helps each other, you know, and, and as a good friend of a good friend of mine says, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. And it's so true. That is true. You know, if you want to achieve some great things in life and have great journeys, meeting great people along the way that'll help you. It's fantastic. I mean, just like yourself, you helped me out with the photography. I, it's like, I really wanted to be at the press conference, but I also wanted to take a look at that new prototype card. And that's what do you do? You send Anthony to go help you out. And then Bruce, Bruce Dunn, who did a great intro for me, which was great right by the desk. And it was just, it was just fantastic to meet such great people. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, um, you know, m- many people may not know this either, but I, I, and I really didn't really know this until recently that um, I guess NASCAR ha- had attempted a Le Mans run uh, at one point, and, and I'm not sure how successful it really was, but, but the fact that they're going to go back and attempt it again, you know, it, to me just speaks volumes and, where the sport has come, you know, and, and where it is going for that matter. I mean, and if you, and, and now when you, when you post those photos, every, every single one of the people behind the car doing the unveil, those are very, very prominent, important people. And it's like, wow, man, these people really are, are truly, you know, truly believe it. And, and, and they're very sincere and, and they're right. This thing is going to be a huge success, I, I believe, over in Europe. Yeah, I agree with you. It really is. It's going to be fantastic, and and it was fan, it was a fantastic event. And props to Frank Kelleher, the president of Daytona International, the entire not just the track, <laughs> the entire <laughs> president of how everything is ran, and the CEO. Props to him for doing an interview on the Allen and Aaron Sports Greater Show and being extremely cool. You know, I heard the interview, I messed up and said track manager. <laughs> I said track president, <laughs> but he wasn't the track president. He's the entire president of the entire event, the entire <laughs> venue. So props to Frank Keller here for doing a fantastic job and and yourself. You, you And I did want to ask you about the – you use a special photography machine, basically, that takes wide shots. Explain that one. It's, it's a little bit old school, but it's interesting. Tell us about that. Mm. Yeah, so um, I'm, you know, in, in the digital age, um, I, I, I still do shoot film. And, um, and, and, and then I know what you're referencing, and that's a photograph. But, but this photograph, I, I use what is called a 4x5 camera. And so what the people listening to that don't know what a 4x5 camera is, it is a, it is a camera that takes a single shot but you put but you're, you're, you put a sheet of film in there that's four inches by five inches, and you can blow, and the image you get, you have to, you know, it's film, so you have to process it and whatnot. But when you get that, you can scan it in to your computer, and you can blow, you, you can make a print feasibly the size of, of a wall if you want to. I mean, it, it's it's just it, it's it's old technology, so to speak, but uh, but uh, it's great. And to put it in perspective, you know, something like that in in, in a digital platform would cost. Last time I knew, they were talking about a half million dollars. Wow. But that's definitely why you need to connect with Anthony Bristol. He's using old school and making it new school. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I I I I I'll I'll tell you this um you know you get uh, you <laughs> I've only talked about this internally with my team but I'll I'll you you'll be the first here to hear this is uh one of these one of these NASCAR races being the 75th anniversary of NASCAR uh we plan as a team to go and uh do a, an event just in film I mean, there'll be no wow. digital photography it all it'll all just be black and white or slide film or you know color negative or or what have you and that's how we'll we'll put it. We'll, we'll, you know, I'm not sure what race it is yet, but you know that. And then we're gonna, you know, do um, do the images in the magazine like that with the brackets and whatnot, so you can tell it's film. Yeah, that sounds really cool and interesting. I mean, definitely, we're gonna look forward to that. It's gonna be something really, really cool to see, and we're gonna make sure we continue to follow you throughout 
your career and and stay keep in touch. So definitely full no to once again you can find Anthony at Ant- at Bristol underscore yeah, my, images uh, one. Yeah, my, that, that that's my Instagram, uh, Bristol underscore images one, and then I also have a Twitter, which is just um, at Bristol underscore images. And then, um, again, uh, my email, if you want to get a hold of me, is info at bristolimages.com. Awesome. And then, That's fantastic. Yep. And then, yep, so um, I'll make sure. And any other, any other great things you want to leave with our great listeners? Just I would encourage anyone, whether, you know, it's not just NASCAR, but, I mean, there's also other great forms of racing out there like IMSA and IndyCar and, you know, and Tony Stewart just, you know, a couple of years ago with that new SRX series. I haven't got a chance to go to one of those yet, but that's another great series that, you know, and, and each one of these serves as a different purpose, you know, it, whatever it may be, but the, the just great forms of racing, you know, great, great food, great entertainment. There, I mean, I tell everyone all the time, there's something at a – there's always something for some. There is always something for someone at a race, no matter what it is, whether it's food or people watching or racing or whatever. That's right. Keep your ears open and keep. Make sure you keep in touch with the next race because you might run into Anthony Bristol there. <laughs> you never know. And, and and the one thing I do want to say too is you know anyone who's you know who, who may who may or may not be listening or whatever hears this later is you know if you got a dream just keep following it because you know I, st- I started out you know local dirt track with i mentioned you know you know a good friend of mine sean freeland and, and his, his a good friend of mine ricky francis jr and his dad you know uncle dicky we call him at lime rock at little lime rock speedway in, in leroy new york but you know you know he, like like the like the title of the video game goes you know from dirt to daytona and i lived that now and you know it Dreams do come true. Just keep you just gotta keep plugging away. Yeah, that's right. You gotta keep your keep plugging away the dreams and they do come true. You, you know, don't give up. A setback is just a setup for a comeback. That's it. Just keep plugging away, keep positive, and it can happen. It's happened for Anthony and it's it's gonna happen for you. That's for sure. So keep positive. And we definitely appreciate you joining us, Anthony. Here on the Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Radio Show, it's been a real pleasure, and we're going to keep in touch. And until we meet each other again, tell them you're saying that you always say when you when someone leaves. <laughs> someone leaves. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone out there, I can't, I can't take this. This is a saying I've gotten from from a very good friend of mine who's who's the historian of the IMRC and he's the historian of Watkins Glen International but he, he he I'll I'll leave you with it I'll leave you with it though and he tells me and everyone else to speed safely That's right speed safely that's correct so make sure you guys do that and you do that too Anthony make sure you be careful on that racetrack be careful on the roof speed safely and <laughs> Take take great care of yourself in the meantime. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. I've had a blast. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been a pleasure having you too. And and definitely so honored to have you on board the Allen and Aaron Sports Radio Show. It's been a real delight. Absolutely. 100% I share the same sentiment for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, Anthony. Yes. Yep. You have a great weekend. Safely. Take care. You, you as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Take care. All right, Alan. All right. So great, uh, great uh, conversation there uh, with Anthony. Uh, certainly uh, good to get that behind the scenes uh, look at uh, the Daytona 500. And that was what I was kind of going over with you uh, this past weekend is just being behind the scenes. It's like being on the sidelines, you know, at the Super Bowl. And we were at the Super Bowl of motor racing essentially over the weekend. Um, I can't get over it. It, it, it. I mean, it's been almost a week now, and it, it's still the, the sound of the cars. So you, you're talking to him about the, the Thunderbirds, 
um, they didn't seem like they wanted to go away. They wanted to steal the show. It seemed like for a little bit there <laughs> on Sunday um, <laughs> when we were doing our live uh, our live feed there. Um, I didn't realize they were going to continue to fly over, and of course we couldn't see because we were underneath the canopy there. But um, what a what a unique event! What a great event! And you know the thing that's so neat about NASCAR, you know, if we were to go to the Super Bowl, which I believe we'll be at someday, or if we were to go to the World Series or the Stanley Cup Finals or the NBA Finals. You're going to have fans of both teams hanging around inside and outside of the stadium or the arena. The neat thing about this is you've got about 25 different teams. So you've got, I don't know, a quarter of a million people inside and outside the track combined. And, you know, it's not just two teams. You know, you've got fans of, of uh, smaller, you know, smaller drivers. Uh, the bigger names, obviously, are going to be the ones who are going to probably have the more fans there. But you and I had a really interesting view right at the very end of the race uh, on Sunday. And that was from the pit box of Kyle Busch, who was at the time leading the race. And it was like the air got let out of the room when suddenly he wasn't leading anymore. And I know that there was a lot of, a lot of language and things like that that were going on there. Uh, it was just such a neat view, such a neat uh, opportunity. And I, I, again, want to thank the, uh, the great people of uh, the Daytona International Speedway for giving us the opportunity to just be there and capture all those things and seeing some of these neat stuff that a lot of people, you know, fans don't get an opportunity to be as close as we were and have the uh, accesses that we did. So we are certainly very appreciative uh, of that opportunity. Um, I don't know if you could put it in one sentence or even in one paragraph, how, how great this weekend was for us. No, I really can't. It was just phenomenal. It really was. It was just such an amazing experience. As you mentioned, we can't thank Daytona international, Speedway enough, NASCAR, and just giving us that access. And we understand when you get access, there's a responsibility to to be somewhat of great character. And we really wanted to make sure we relayed that to the fans that it was just such a great experience. As you mentioned, we were in Kyle Busch's right there in the pit box and the crew. And it, it was just something that, you know, you get a chance to see them changing doing a pit stop, you get a chance to smell the, the fuel and <laughs> as you mentioned here, the language. And I even saw some pictures where Pit Bull, you know, Daniel Suarez wasn't too far from us either. So <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just it's just an amazing, amazing experience. Can't thank the drivers enough. And, and gotta thank Logan Musaraka and you know, Amber and a lot of them, and it was just so hospitable and cool. Yeah, I can't really put it in words. I mean, as you mentioned, the Thunderbirds, you know, I've did several interviews with the Thunderbirds, which I'm going to make sure I get out this coming up week. It's been so much content. Imagine that, that you, we love bringing you guys great content. It was just so much content for us to put it all out in one blurb. It, it's not even possible. It's just so much. So I'm putting out some of it, some of it at a time, but man, it was just phenomenal. There's so many great stories, so many great interviews, so many great press conferences, seeing the race car drivers up close. As you mentioned, it, it was just something that I, I'm still on cloud nine and this is, I can't even believe it's getting close to a week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you can watch it on TV, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but the, the, the TV doesn't do it justice, kind of like uh, what Anthony was saying there before. The the wide lens view, if you will, and from for him being up on the roof there, the only view you could have had better than being on the roof would have been up in the blimp. I mean, that, let's, let's be honest here. That was the only only better view you probably could have had. So, um, But to see everything kind of develop, and I know there was a point towards the end of the race on Saturday – where you and I went up into an area where a lot of fans like to gather. It's on that roof area on the infield. And you can see down the back stretch, you can see uh, over the, the camping area. Can't see it as well, but it, you kind of get the opportunity to see what happens back there. And it is a very neat thing to be able to watch. Um, and uh, again, you know, all the people that were there, all the, uh, you know, the sponsors and, and just the fanfare that goes along with this, it's a neat event. And then, you know, talking about it too, you know, we, and, and you and I were there for the, the red carpet event Sunday 
uh, right before the, the 500 started, you run into people that you don't think are going to be there necessarily. You, uh, we saw uh, Alvin Kamara um, running back for the Saints, of course, and former NBA player uh, Shane Battier walked right by us. And then you had uh, several of the, the drivers walk right by us. So I remember seeing uh, Chase Elliott, Bubba Wallace, um, I believe Austin Dillon went right past us. There were several other drivers as well and, and some former drivers uh, at the same time. So, you know, it's kind of neat to, to have that experience there. I think, uh, like you said, cloud nine, that, that won't wear off anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're right. You just, the people you don't anticipate that'll be there and Blippy was there. I mean, that's, that's somebody like to me, that yeah. was a big time because <laughs> when I first saw him on media day, I was like a kid. I couldn't believe it because me and the kids wanted to, to meet him. And it's not that easy to meet him. He's based out of California. I know here in Florida, people love to travel, but we've kept our ear to the ground. And in the entire time, I would say in like seven, eight years, there was one appearance he had did. And it was just like a pop-up appearance by the beach and like Delray beach, which was far away from us. And he said, he's going to be there for a couple of hours. And it was just too far away and logistically. And, and that was it. That was the only time mm-hmm. I've ever heard him doing a public appearance. And for me to run into him at Daytona 500 of all places <laughs> was just like, wow. And, but that just goes to show you the people that can show up. You know, Tiffany Haddish was there. Charlotte Flair, the daughter of Ric Flair. I got a chance to ask her a question at a press conference. I got a chance to ask Tiffany Haddish a question. And I got a chance to win, to ask the winner, congratulations to Ricky Stenhouse Jr., a question as well after he won the Daytona 500 and even took a picture of beautiful wife and their dog, <laughs> Ruby. So it, it just gets better and better. Yeah, definitely an awesome experience, uh, one that we'll definitely never forget. And this is just the beginning. We're going to be back doing things like this uh, again in the future. Um, it's right around the corner, as they say. So um definitely very cool um and that content will continue to come out folks there's there's no shortage of it i mean you probably have several weeks worth of stuff that you can put out there um so definitely uh check out our facebook uh, page take uh, check out uh, the uh, instagram and uh, keep an eye out there's new stuff coming out literally every day in fact i can't even keep up with it because there's so much of it I, i literally am checking my phone you know all the time and and just new things are popping up left and right left and right so um great experience look forward to doing it again and uh, glad that we were able to experience that and experience that with uh, not only just you and I but also the the friends we made while we were there over the weekend I know that um, you mentioned Bruce Dunn Um, he was one of the big uh, individuals we had a chance to speak to Uh, there's a few others as well and and uh, you know they they made us feel like right like we were right at home you know they they were people who had been there for several years and you and I are kind of the rookies, if you will, coming in. You're one year more experienced than I am, but they all made us feel very welcome and kind of like we were family, and that was a really neat uh, neat feeling there. It really was. Everybody was very, very cool, very hospitable, and even though it has been my second year, there was a lot of things I experienced this time around that I didn't experience last time because last time it was just a weekend. This time I stayed longer from Wednesday, and there was some new things I didn't experience. You know, media day was new. That was new to me because we missed it last year, and it it was just a a great, great experience. I also – the practice that the Thunderbirds did, I was – last year I had missed that because we came in again Saturday and Sunday. So it it did pay to get there early because it was just – I felt like it was a whole other experience being there a little longer. Yes, there was some things that were the same, but there was a lot of things that were different. And you came in at the right year because of the 75th anniversary. They did not mm-hmm. have that carpet walk last year at all. None of that was there. That stage, the, the walkway, that was not there at all last year. That was a new experience for me too. So it felt like it was different. They unveiled the new prototype car. I didn't. I don't recall that happening last year. So it, it was definitely very unique and different in a lot of ways. Alvin Kamara wasn't there last year. He was there this year. <laughs> I didn't see Shane Battier last year. I saw him this year. Flippy, I didn't see him last year. I saw him this year. Charlotte, you know, Tiffany Haddish, the band that was there. 
the it, it was just you know totally different. It felt like a totally different Daytona 500. Yeah, and every year is going to be a little bit different. We'll see things next year we didn't see this year, and you know it'll probably be the same the year after that too. So, uh, but a great event. Uh, we can talk about this pretty much all the way until the next race. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at, at this point, uh, but uh, a lot of other things to get to, of course, here tonight as yeah. well, Alan. Uh, you know, tomorrow is uh, the first day of spring training, and I'm not just talking about pitchers and catchers reporting. That was last week. The games actually start tomorrow. Um, so wow. play ball. Uh, obviously, we're going to have a lot to talk about there as spring training gets kicked off. The nice thing about this year as opposed to a year ago, last year, and it's hard to believe it's already been a year since this happened, but you know, last year we were dealing with the, the lockout and the uncertainty of whether there was going to even be a spring training or even a season for that matter. Of course, it ended up coming to fruition. It was a little bit uh, abbreviated. This is the first normal spring training, knock on wood, that we're going to have had in four years since 2019. 2020 was obviously the pandemic hit uh, basically right in the middle of uh, spring training. 2021, I remember two years ago going to a game, and there was about one fifth of the normal amount of people there and nobody sat next to you unless you were in a group and, you know, they kind of frowned on you, you know, if you congregated with people in too big, too big of a group and, you know, all the stuff that came along with that. And then, you know, last year, as I mentioned there a second ago, um, the, um, the schedule went from what it was supposed to be to having to be rescheduled. And uh, that was due to, of course, the lockout. So this is finally four years later, finally, we are back to uh, what we would consider normal as far as spring training is concerned. I'll actually be uh, over on uh, the east coast of Florida at a game in Jupiter uh, between the St. Louis Cardinals and the Washington Nationals tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Not looking forward to the drive, but I'm looking forward to the game itself. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, I'm excited about baseball being back. Um, I'm not sure where your stance is on that, but uh, where do you feel uh, things are on baseball? <laughs> I'm excited, and we're excited at the Allen and Aaron Sports Talk Radio Show. And so is Sam Scola. We're going to actually play a great song for you guys called Major League Baseball to kick off, you know, the spring training that games have started. And I'll give you my thoughts on the Major League Baseball season kicking off. But first, a great tune written and produced by Sam Scola, our great music writer. Let's go ahead and hear the song Major League Baseball by Sam Scola. Major League 
kick off a Major League Baseball season right there. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam Scola. We really appreciate you with that. It's fantastic. And, yeah, I mean, baseball is in effect. We are going to be having a great season. And that's the great thing about the Allen and Aaron Sports, the greatest show, is that we're knocking on the door of getting official access to Major League Baseball where we'll be able to report at the game. Now, this week I did put in requests. Unfortunately, they were full. That was the Yankees, but there are other teams and other opportunities that will come up as soon as this week. So we're going to try to get you guys some behind the scenes, some insight from Major League Baseball. And let me actually ask you that, Aaron. What do you think the Allen and Aaron Sports Radio Show will bring to the table when we go and interview Major League Baseball players? Well, I think we're a unique uh, uh, type of show uh, compared to a lot of the other things out there. Podcasts are a newer, a newer style. We're smaller, obviously, so we have a different feel, a different audience um, than some of the bigger guys out there. Um, and I think maybe that'll, you know, I'm not saying with every person we're going to try and talk to, but maybe that'll um, take a little pressure off some of the people we have an opportunity to speak to. Um, I think a lot of times, and I'm, I'm just going from my view on it, a lot of times you take somebody like Aaron Boone, the manager of the Yankees, and he's getting hounded by the New York press all the time. I mean, probably from day one they reported to camp, what are you going to do to win the World Series finally? Well, we would ask similar questions like that, but it's more of a personable feel, um, perspective, and you know, trying to keep it a lighthearted type of situation. I'm not saying we wouldn't ask tough questions, but – um, I think that we can uh, can really get a lot of great content there. That's what it's all about. That's that's the number one thing on our show. I think is providing our listeners, and we have great listeners here, of course, who are always very encouraging. But providing them the content that they deserve to be able to see and hear. And so I think that's what we're going to be able to do. And having the access to you know the clubhouse and possibly even the field, um, you know, down the line, I think is going to be. Really cool. And here's the thing, too. We just did this in Daytona. We rubbed shoulders with other people who have been in the media industry a lot longer than we have. They've seen how things have changed over the years, and they gave us some great tips. And I think we may be able to run into that kind of stuff in the clubhouses as well. You think about all the great reporters that are out there for Major League Baseball that work for ESPN and Major League Baseball Network and some of the other big uh, media um, organizations. Those are great things to see. And so I think we can we can definitely have – some of those things help us move forward and get bigger in the future. I would definitely agree. I think we're going to bring a different dynamic that most fans won't see. You're going to get more personable questions. I think a lot of times you get some of the same mundane questions. You'll get a lot different from, from us. We're going to go ahead and bring a different dynamic. We'll also be able to bring you guys great insight and behind the scenes with photography interviews and it is going to be a great thing you know we're just uh chomping at the bit for the opportunity and you just like the Toyota 500 and the xfl we're going to bring you something that's very different than what most other people will bring and they, not only that i think the players will notice it too i really do because in the xfl a lot of the players have taken a really really great desire for more and more of our content, you will you can see that as soon as we do an interview, the players and, and just you can feel that they want to see that content. As soon as I'm done doing a press conference with one of the coaches or players, they, they can't wait for it to drop. And I apologize to Jacob Jones because I was trying to post up one of the interviews that we did right after. And unfortunately, Instagram is one of the reasons why I don't like Instagram it's, it sometimes gives some some type of errors all of a sudden. It does happen from time to time. It doesn't work as smooth. And I tried to post that interview up several times, and it wouldn't co- cooperate. That's why I put up the picture and the link of the interview instead of the interview like I did prior. It wasn't anything personal. It's just I tried several times. and could not get it to upload. It's one of the things that happens sometimes with Instagram. But that's how hungry – the players are for our content. And I think it's going to be the same thing in major league baseball because it's not the same stuff that you get with us. And I'm excited for the opportunity. I know we're going to get when the, everything lines up just right for us. That's when we're going to get access. And I feel like it's going to happen and we're going to go ahead and do a great job for you guys. In fact, 
We're going to bring on somebody here who is very different than what you would find. Let me bring him on right now, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> How you Thanks, doing so far God. tonight, Lou? All right. So I'm a little late, Look. but I was doing, uh, you know, I was taking care of, uh, you know, business for the show tomorrow. Better late than never. We're glad you're here. How you been? Yeah, I'm glad I got on. All right. I want details on Daytona since you, got, since you guys were on last week. I want details. <laughs> Uh, definitely, we got a lot. So I heard I'll it was let a great race coming down, coming down to double overtime. I mean, I was, I think, the first in that race. Yeah, that's yeah, I believe it point. was. Yeah, I believe it in, was. In fact, Aaron, um, let me get you that point. Why do you think Kyle didn't win, Kyle Busch? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, especially late in the race when you're making those pushes in the final, I don't know, five or six laps or so, you notice he was on the inside, and you need that push. You, you actually need to have that that aerodynamic push that the outside lane ended up getting. And I forget who it was that took the lead there because there was a huge wreck right after it. Um, but I, I, what's going to stick with me forever is all the people who are in the area and all the expletives that got thrown out there they obviously were fans of, of, of Kyle Busch. And I looked up into his, uh, where his, um, his uh, pit crew chief was at up in the, the box there. They sit in a, uh, I'm not sure what they call it, but they sit in this thing that's a, probably about 10 feet off the ground, and every single yeah. person who was up there was just absolutely um, disappointed and upset that he uh, obviously was no longer in the lead. So, uh, But it was a unique perspective. It, it was almost like being, like I was telling Alan earlier, it was almost like being on the sidelines you know, for the final kick to win the Super Bowl kind of a thing. So really, really yeah. neat experience. Um you know, that, that's that's something like like I was saying before, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget. So, Yeah, it was. Right. And, and, and the only advice I would give to Kyle Busch, and I say this with all due respect, I think Kyle Busch needs to stop saying negative stuff. Like, stop saying that to win the Daytona yeah. 500 is, is a bigger feat than winning the lotto. Like, you can win – he can win the lotto quicker than he can yeah. the Daytona 500. You need to stop – Take that out of your vocabulary completely because words matter. When you put stuff like that in the atmosphere, it comes back to, to kind yeah. of haunt you. Yeah. Stop saying that. Like I'm saying that as a, as a friend. Stop saying that you – those things like that. And I kind of hinted that to him in the press conference. What I, yeah, I cool. kind of asked is like, are you – not like that. I said, are, you know, are you still keeping a positive attitude about you actually winning this event? Because I know it's been tough for you. I kind of worded it in a nice way, but you got to – you can't be your own worst enemy and start saying stuff like that. And Boy, I died every time I said that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can't. Like, no. you just – Kyle Busch is talented enough, and he can win the Daytona 500. You can do it. I know it hasn't happened yet, but you could have won it on the 75th anniversary and turned things around. You can do it. Yeah. And – and what are your thoughts about it, Lou? What are your thoughts about the day twenty five hundred? I didn't get a chance to watch it, but you know, I had I had my colleagues, you know, uh, watching it, and, and they thought this was like one of the best um, races in Daytona history. So I have to get have to get back. But Bush not winning it—that's that's quite an upset. I don't like to see him win myself. And, and you know, I will let you know the listening audience know that. I did speak to some media, members of the media after the race, and what they yeah. told me is that sometimes when you're ahead and you got two laps to go in the day 2500, sometimes that's not the best place to be in because no. it, it sometimes can, can not be a good thing. What are your thoughts on, on that strategy, Aaron, not being ahead in the last two, ra- two laps? Well, and, and kind of what I said to you the other night, you know, if you're in the top 10, maybe even the top 12, in the final three to five laps, you have a legitimate shot because everyone is making those moves. You, you kind of notice lesser lead changes, lesser aggressiveness in pretty much every other part of the race, except for maybe at the end of each of the, uh, each of the stages. That's more for points and that kind of thing. The big moves, this is why there's so many crashes at the end. I predicted this um, when we did our live feed on Sunday Mm. The last 20 laps of the race is going to take as long as the first 50 laps of the race because there's going to be cautions. Right. There's going to be, and you you know you look you look how long these cautions went. I think they went around the track five times under caution, 
And so more moves are being made. Positioning matters a lot more in those final five laps. And if you have a chance, you're in the top 10 or 12 cars, which, you know, you think about it this way, they're only about a second apart from each other, maybe a second and a half. I mean, that, that, that seems like an eternity probably out there to some of them. But all it takes is the, the car or two ahead of you, you know, hitting the wall or, you know, cutting a tire or, you know, any number of things can happen. And suddenly you've got a chance to, uh, to win. And um, that's kind of how it goes. Now, I would say I would be a lot more comfortable if I was leading the race going into the white flag and coming all the way around, you know, that last two and a half miles, I feel a lot more comfortable there. But, you know, it, it just it, it played out exactly as I thought it would. I didn't have a, a person I necessarily predicted would win. Part of it, you have to get lucky. You think about some of the great drivers that didn't even finish the race because they got into an accident earlier on and, and got taken out. So um, part of it, you just get a little bit lucky. you got to be a little fortunate to avoid any of the, the collisions out there. And then the skill part is just, you know, staying at the front of the front of the pack and staying in that top 8 to 12 uh, cars. And, you know, as you come around the, the you know, turn four, it's, it's on, and you never know what can happen. I, you know, the whole weekend – that's even something I brought up to Ricky when I interviewed him at the Daytona 500 in the press conference. The whole weekend, guys kept saying winning the Daytona 500 is circumstantial, but yet Ricky Stenhouse Jr. did talk a lot about strategy. So do you feel that it's all, you know, circumstantial, or do you feel as if it's strategy and skill? It's a little bit of both because the strategy doesn't – Strategy doesn't come in until – the strategy part of it is periodical through the race. When am I coming in for my pit? When am I coming in for new tires? When Am I going to stretch another two laps on the tank of fuel that I have? So that that's part of it there. The other strategy is where do I position myself in those last few laps of the race? The circumstantial part is still out there racing on the lead lap or racing at all, whether you avoided a, a big collision where a bunch of cars got taken out. So that that's really worked. I think both of those things have to play into effect. And again, a little bit of it's luck. I'd say about 10% of it's luck. So, I, you know, I, I think my takeaway is it is that it's circumstantial somewhat, but I think a lot of it has to do with strategy skill. I think that's the bigger part. I think that, and also, you know, yes, you have to be in the right place at the right time, but in order for you to be in the right place at the right time, you have to kind of strategically get yourself in the right place at the right time. You know, you have to kind of maneuver, use your skill, and then, like as you mentioned, avoid some of those wrecks, kind of like in the movie Cars, and there you go. You're there. First so one, I the think second one. The first <laughs> one. You know, where he, he he avoided that big wreck, the first yes, one. Yes, and, yes. I and like he, the movie myself, actually. And he ended up, you know, have a three-way tie, but... I think it's skill, strategy, and also, you know, good fortune. But I think good fortune, yeah. you kind of create that. And it's, it's got to be mostly skill, though. I, I agree. Like, I know they said circumstantial, but I think it's a lot of skill. Because, look, a guy like Jimmy Johnson won it seven times. Ricky Pe- Richard Petty won it seven times. So if you have multiple winners of the same event, it can't all be circumstantial. No. Not at all. You know, they know yeah. something that not, they're not sharing with the general public, but they know something. What are your thoughts yeah, on that, Aaron? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, obviously, you're going to have the more experienced drivers. You know, Jimmy Johnson was probably the most experienced in this race that are going to have those those moments that they know how to do things better than somebody who's only been in the race maybe two or three years. Um at the same time, here is the thing that's different now than it was 20 years ago. The cars are a lot different than they were 20 years ago. You talked about the next-gen cars. So the cars are different. Um, the way that uh, you strategize, um, you know, coming in for fuel is, is different. It, it's, it's very analytical. Not that it wasn't 20 years ago, but it's even more so now. It's under the microscope. Yeah. Even more so. And this isn't just racing. This is in all, all sports. But we'll, since we're talking about racing, the data is what's going to determine it all. The data is going to be what these guys determine. And, and it's the crew chief's ultimate decision. Hey, you're coming in on this lap for your your next ch- change of tires. And that's 
what we're going to go with because that's what the data tells us to do. So, you know, those are the important things, and that might be part of the circumstantial part that they were referring to. Some of it is things that are beyond their control. Uh, all you can do is drive the car. Hopefully the car stays in one piece. And, uh, you, again, a little bit of it is luck. Yeah, so if you were talking to Kyle Busch, what advice would you give sure. him? Sorry, uh, Lou, go ahead. If you believe in luck, yeah, fine. But <laughs> when it comes to that, when it comes to all this, you know, I, don't, I don't believe in luck. I, I, it can't be. You know, they, they have they have to have a certain – you have to have a certain skill to do this kind of work. To answer yeah, your question – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. To answer your question, what I would tell Kyle Bush, and I'm not sure how many starts he's made at this race. I think this is probably his 14th or 15th year, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest here. I, I watched Dale Earnhardt for a good 12 years before, unfortunately he passed away in 2001, as everybody knows, he won it in 98. That was his 20th year. And he had had some very, very close calls. Uh, 1990 comes to mind. He had the lead on the final lap until turn three and suddenly his car slowed down. And I believe he had a, a cut tire. Derek Cope ended up winning that race. And I'll quote exactly what Dale Earnhardt said um, as he came back into the to the um, uh, to the uh, infield into the media. Of course, it was a lot different uh, 32 years ago, 33 years ago, whatever it is. But quoting Dale Earnhardt, he said, "This is a this is a Daytona 500. I'm not supposed to win the damn thing." So <laughs> he had a little bit of a sense of humor about it, and I think that would be what I would give as Kyle Busch's advice. You know, yes, yeah, so you want to win it. I'm not going to take that away from you, but at the same time. You know, have a little bit of humor. Um, play it off a little light, lightly. Don't take it too serious. I mean, it is something serious, but at the same time, sometimes circumstances happen. So that's that's another part of where I see the circumstances come in. I, you know what? I think it's a. I would say it's skill, strategy, and just you have to have good fortune. I don't. I'm with Lou. I don't believe in a bunch of luck. I I think you're going to get the blessing. Exactly. You know, if you put yourself in that, you have the right mindset, and and you put yourself in a great position. Because I, I heard Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in his press conference, he talked a lot about strategy. He talked about the fact that he was surprised that somebody took the inside lane when he felt as if that person should have taken the outside lane. You know, it's kind of like gave him an opportunity. There was a lot of strategy he talked about, and Most yeah, I. I I, I think it's a lot of it's strategy. I think a lot of it's strategy, your mindset, and sure. preparing well, having great team, mm -hmm. and you know it, it's it's skill too. Because I, I can't say it's all luck. I know they've been trying to put that on there, like all luck. You get in a race car driving 200 miles an hour against other people, and you end up winning. I, I don't think that's luck. I really no. don't. Not at all. Not at all. I don't think that thing is luck. And as you mentioned, to your point, Aaron, it's a lot of precision yeah, involved. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, there's some good fortune. I think it's like anything in, in life. If you keep working really hard at it, you have the right mental attitude, right strategy, some days things go your way. You know, this, 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 that's how it is. But that usually doesn't happen until you put in all the hard work. You know, like – you might draw up a play in basketball and you expect the defender to be there to at least block your shot or attempt to block your shot. Well, guess what? You do such a great move on the day of game day, he slips and now you have a wide open shot. You know, it's not luck. You practice that a lot. You prepared well. And it just so happened you had gotten a little bit of a break and the guy slipped, but you, you prepared that he was going to be in front of you block Attempted to block your shot. Unless you, you know? believe in dumb luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just like us seeing Alvin Kamara on the red carpet. We got there early. We prepared for us just in case we did run into somebody. We was expecting to see somebody that we, you know, on the red carpet that we didn't see last year. And it just so happened to be Shane Battier and Alvin Kamara. They walked right past. And, Alvin, and Shane Battier... Yeah. We was fortunate that he actually went by first, and then a couple minutes later, Alvin Kamara walked by. 
But the reason why I say it was fortunate because Shay walked by was because we were like, oh, snap. Shay Batty had just walked by. We're not going to let somebody else walk by us the next time. We're going to make an opportunity to stop them. And lo and behold, it was Alvin Kamara. We stopped them. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. we yeah. kind of strategized what we were going to do. It wasn't luck. We said, you know what? We're not going to let the next person go by us. We're going to make an attempt to stop them. And he, he right. pleasantly stopped. He pleasantly stopped and posed. Yeah, that was a really neat experience there. That's something we'll probably never – Never see something exactly like that again. He, he kind of right place at the right time. I mean, that's really, really a lot of what that was. That was great. And uh, you know, nobody. You know what, Lou? I'm a. You know, I guess so I get to tweet my heart a little bit. Nobody knew who Alvin Kamara was. I was the one who recognized him. I was like, as soon as I saw oh, him, I was like, yo, that's. I said, that's Alvin Kamara right there. I'm like, that's <laughs> himself. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Nobody really. I guess the racing fans, they didn't realize who he was, but I, I recognized it. as soon as I could put my eyes on him, I said, yo, that's Alvin Kamara. It wasn't even like, was no hesitation. Right. <laughs> so, yo, that's Alvin Kamara, you know. I mean, we're going to helmet on, so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I stopped him, and, you know. You know, like, people didn't know who he was, but I, I knew exactly who he was. Not the and, helmet I know. Well, you got to know what these guys look like without the helmet on, you know. And the best way to do that yeah, for fans yeah. is to watch press conferences and watch ESPN. You'll get a chance to see right. them, uh, you know, really without are. the helmet on. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. that's a good point there. <laughs> yeah. But, Lou, yeah, what do you got cooking this weekend? Well, of course, we got – uh, the arrival of spring training, so we'll cover that. We'll take a look at the upcoming WBC uh, Classic coming up. We'll recap uh, the uh, Daytona 500 and wrap up um, Oh, NBA All-Star Week, of course. Uh, we'll also take a look at the uh, upcoming MLS schedule, which their season begins tomorrow. I know you're all thinking, it's a little bit too early for soccer. It's too cold in the Northeast. Well, guess what, folks? We've got an area you like it or not. <laughs> so, so we'll take care of all that plus our usual features um, the uh, idiot of the week which uh, we'll we have a good one this week uh, your thoughts and comments which are always welcome um, I don't think we're going to be able to do trivia, trivia tomorrow because our regular trivia uh, authority uh, will be absent but we will have the um, this, week in, this week in history the feel good story of the week and since it's that time of the month the best and worst of February. And uh, I've got mine all set right. So if you guys have time between 4 and 6 tomorrow at Eastern Time, dial the following number, 512-543-4662. I'll repeat it again, 512-543-4662. Yep, that's right. That's Lou, the Enhanced Sports Show, between 4 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Zone. That's tomorrow, 512 543 Four six six two. Again, that's five one two five four three four six six two. Make sure you support Lou and the Enhanced Shows tomorrow between four and six p.m. Eastern Standard Time Zone. He's going to have a great show for you guys. Oh, I certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're going to hold you to that. Oh well, yes, we're also going to cover week two of uh, uh, that league. Week two of that league. <laughs> we call it the SFL. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <Is that sarcastically? laughs> All my XFL. Better hurry on our lives, folks, because it may only last another two weeks. You know what? If you watched any one of those games, let's let's be fair. What did you guys think of the, about the games? It needs work. <laughs> wow! In what way? Well, I, was, what, what's it? I was in Daytona, so I can't really say I didn't get a chance to to right. watch. So, <laughs> and what? And what well, I'm curious to hear that. In what way, Lou? Oh, look! I mean, the, the, the offense. I mean, the, the play quality was rather poor. I mean, you know, I only was able to saw one game of it, and you know, it didn't even look like real football. I mean, if this keeps up, it might even last more, less than the uh, than the uh, AAF of 2019. <laughs> You know what? I think it's going to stick around. I really do. I, I watched I watched two of the games so far. 
even when I was at Daytona, I said there was I watched it on my phone, the ESPN Plus app, and it was it was very good. The Orlando Guardians game, and I watched the game last night, so oh, I, I was yeah, impressed yeah. with the with the production. And you know this the I home opener is coming up this this Sunday here in Orlando, but. I think you guys are gonna. I think you guys are gonna be wrong about this one. I think they will just stick around. That team. Just remember that team was ours first, not you. <laughs> we have but first. Yeah. My XFL players and fans would definitely disagree with you guys. Of course. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that. <laughs> So I'll be calling tomorrow. Yes, I'll give an announcement on that. I'll give your predictions for week two, if they're still going on, because we'll be canceled before the game starts. So, uh, oh run away your hands. I'm hoping, I'm really, really hoping that Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson hear you. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember the WLAF, the World League, uh, the UFL, uh, the league I also just mentioned, uh, what do they do? They're all gone. This might be next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, make sure you talk about the XFL on your show tomorrow night. Oh, I We're going to talk about the XFL <laughs> a little bit later. It'll be trash talk, <laughs> it'll, it'll be discussed. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Well, good luck, and if we're still on, and if it's still here next week, I'll get ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be here next week. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll, I'll hold you to it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, All right, good buddy, Lou. Thanks for joining us. You have a great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, Lou. I appreciate you. Thanks. Good night. Take it easy now. Have a good weekend. (laughs) That's our great buddy, Lou. You know, for your XFL fans, cover your ears when Lou comes on. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, obviously he's got some points that those other leagues didn't last. I think this one has, as we've discussed a couple times in the past, prepared, I think, a little bit better than some of the previous versions. So hopefully things, you know, do um, pan out the right way. I think that the, the, the smart thing that I think they're doing this time around is they're not trying to grow too quickly. I think if they had started this league with, I don't know how many teams, I think there's eight teams in there right now. If they started right. with you know, 16 or 20 teams, that would have probably been more problematic than anything else. But I think there are certain small They'll probably, you know, as long as everything is continuing to progress, I think that they will eventually expand. More markets will become interested in having a team, and, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But I think you have to start with what you have and, and um, you know, build upon that as things move forward. So, um, you know, the great thing is we talked about a lot of stuff here tonight, Major League Baseball. Um, Lou called in right as we were getting started on that. Um, I'm excited. I think uh, obviously we're going to wait a few weeks before we give our predictions for the 2023 season. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of things can happen during spring training. Injuries occur, of course. We don't know how that's going to shape some of these pennant races that are going to happen, but um, I'm excited. I'm going to be at a game every weekend for the most part, the entire month of March. And of course, tomorrow down in Jupiter as well. So um, I enjoy traveling around the state. You know, the nice thing about being here in Florida, it's the grapefruit league. So you've got teams, you know, spread out all over the state. I live in Lakeland. The Tigers train right here, about 20 minutes from where I live. Um, you know, you're over in the Tampa area. The Yankees are right, you know, within uh, what, maybe 30 minutes of where you're at. And then you go a little further over, you got the uh, Phillies in Clearwater. you got the Blue Jays in Dunedin. And you go down to um, uh, Bradenton. The Pirates are there. The Orioles are down in Sarasota. The Braves are down in, in uh, Northport. The Rays are actually this year playing at home at Tropicana Field because of the hurricane uh, that went through back in September, it did some damage to their ballpark. So they're going to be playing um, their home spring games for the most part at, uh, at their home stadium. So um, 
we'll get some great pictures, hopefully, and uh, be able to get some great content out there for you guys there. And I know, uh, Alan, uh, not to let the cat out of the bag here, but you got to do an interview with uh, a pretty popular former big league ball player here recently. Yeah, I got to really thank Willie Horton and also got to thank my great friend Daryl Chapper for setting up that interview. I was just floored that we got a chance to interview Willie Horton, the legend, the Detroit Tiger legend. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful interview. Can't thank Willie Horton and Daryl Chapper enough. And it was just amazing to speak to Willie Horton because this you know, if you listen to our interview, Willie Horton played with Jackie Robinson. So he met and known Jackie Robinson. He played during segregation. On top of that, he went ahead and played long enough for not only for him to play with Jackie Robinson, but he played alongside Al Kaline. And then he got a chance to meet Barack Obama. He also met and got to know Martin Luther King Jr. and Barack Obama. So he went full circle from living through segregation, having stood up. He basically stood up for peace during the race riot in Detroit. You could Google that and get more information on that. And then yep. – exactly. So he went from playing in segregation, trying to have peace during a race riot – met Martin Luther King Jr. and was cool with him and then to come full circle for him to have also met the first African American president, which is Barack Obama. I think that's just wonderful. That is just a whole history lesson right there. You don't meet too many people that have met all of those people and have not and not just like hi bye, but have actually known them. I think that's yeah, remarkable. Yeah. And his career spanned for, I think, uh, I think he played in four different decades, if I remember correctly. So that, that shows longevity right there, too, which is always, that's always a positive thing. You don't, you don't see that nowadays. At least you don't see it on such a great scale. So that's a really cool thing there, too. Yeah, and then to do it in Black History Month, it was like I felt like I was going through Black History. And yeah, it was, it was just amazing. And it was just a, a wonderful interview. And you know, Mr. Willie Horton was so kind and letting me know that he has an event coming up in early March, a bowling event by Orange Bowling in in Lakeland. You probably might know where it's at on the north side of Lakeland, Orange Bowling, mm-hmm. if you may with that, that's coming up. And I, I gave him my word I will be there. So I'm going to attend that event. And, you know, he said he's going to be there along with other celebrities. I'm going to come there prepared to meet him and you know, it is such an honor to to have interviewed Willie Horton. I, I'm just still in awe and shock how that all worked out. And I got to thank Daryl Chapper, who's my friend, but he he told me, hey, would you like to interview him? I said, sure. He set it up. You know, we end up exchanging phone numbers and I, you know, he, we set it up for Thursday evening because that works out good for his schedule and Willie Horton is old school. He doesn't do Zoom. He told me he doesn't do Zoom. So we did it at a time that was not during our show time to accommodate him because that was really the only other way I can really get this interview to work for Willie Horton outside of doing it face to face, which I've hoped that I do next month. I got to give props to Willie Horton. I am just so floored that I was able to interview him. You guys need to check out that interview because it is it is remarkable that the man really, you know, he ended up getting a statue in Comerica Park, but he also has several street names after him in Lakeland. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah, he does. Talk about that, Aaron. Well, you know, here, here's the thing. Um, obviously, a lot of um, Michiganers, Detroitians, if you however you want to refer to them as, they love their Tigers. In fact, Detroit and Lakeland are the longest standing um, spring training uh, city partnership in Major League Baseball. I want to say it's at 65 or 70 years now that the Tigers have been training here. So there, there's uh, just a lot of people who come down here from Detroit and the Michigan, uh, uh, Michigan and Detroit area, of course. And they either come down here just for spring or they come down here, you know, during the winter months. And so they take their Tigers very seriously. In fact, uh, 
I believe it was 2017, I happened to be out there at uh, Joker Marchant Stadium or Public Field, as it's referred to now, and um, in some of the backfields, running into some of the people you'd see back there. Um, Al Kaline, of course, uh, he passed away here just a few years ago. He was he was back there um, chatting away. Um, also, um, Jim Jim Leland, uh, former uh, Tiger manager. And so here in Lakeland, they take the Tigers just as serious as they do up in Detroit with, you know, street names and, you know, things of that nature. In fact, um, I was actually at an event at, at uh, Joker Marchant Stadium here, I guess it was two weeks ago now, and there's a very famous former uh, television show star that used to attend Tigers games, and I didn't think he was going to be out there, but back in the day, Tom Selleck actually used to show up to games here in Lakeland, so being a big Tiger fan in, 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 uh, in himself, so um, I think the history here in Lakeland is, is very, very big, kind of the way it was over in Vero Beach for the Dodgers for the 60 or so years they played there. You mentioned Jackie Robinson's name there before. The Dodgers were training in Vero Beach when they were still playing in Brooklyn. So there was a, a very big history there, and it's just the same here in Lakeland. Um, some of the big names that have, have come through Tigers history. And, uh, you know, here's the other thing, too, just to throw out there about the Tigers, uh, not to get uh, too off topic here, but since we're talking about the Detroit Tigers in Lakeland, this is uh, Miguel Cabrera's final season. Um, hard to believe he's been in the league for 20 years now. And so, you know, if you're in the Lakeland area, hopefully you can get out to a game and hopefully he's playing and you can watch him uh, for the final time. Yeah, that's remarkable. I, you know, I didn't even know he, it's been that long. Time flies. And, yeah, it was just it was just really awesome to interview Willie Horton. Amazing, amazing man. A lot of great history. And you don't find that too often, folks, a Major League Baseball player who has a statue in Camara. America Park has street names and he doesn't live actually in Lakeland, but he does come to Lakeland quite often. He did say that during the interview, I've mistaken him for living in Lakeland because Daryl Chapel lives in Lakeland. And I know that I've seen Willie Horton, at least a picture of him at Simpson Park in Lakeland. So I assumed he was living in Lakeland, but he is actually not living in Lakeland. He does have grandkids in this area and he's very, very, he comes to Lakeland quite often, but he's like me. I come to Lakeland quite often, but I don't actually live in Lakeland. So I thought that was really cool. He supports young baseball players that are trying to make it in the inner city. And like, like he said, and just like Anthony said earlier, if you got a dream, go ahead and chase it. Go ahead and go after it. Don't let somebody else determine what you can and can't do. And guys got to really listen to that interview I saved that interview, and to me, that's like a history lesson right there. <laughs> yeah, definitely a very cool experience without question. So, so really cool stuff. We'll have more uh, really cool content as the uh, weeks and months uh, go by, uh, spring training for the next five or so weeks. Um, obviously, the big events in the sporting world are going to be coming up here in the next uh, six, seven weeks. Uh, opening day of Major League Baseball is uh, just a little more than a month away. Uh, we'll have uh, – you know, March Madness and the Final Four and all that good stuff. And then, of course, uh, the early to mid part of April will be focused on the Masters, which is always a, a very, very fun uh, event to discuss. Uh, Alan, is there anything else you wanted to mention here this evening? Yes. For those who non-believers or the ones who are believers, I'm hoping it's more your believers, the XFL season is going to start off <laughs> on Sunday, the home of Home opener, I should say. It's game two for the Orlando Guardians. The first game they started away. It is the official XFL home opener on Sunday. We are honored and delighted here at the Allen and Aaron Sports Radio Show to have media access. So I'll get a chance to get a lot of great content for you guys. We'll get Clubhouse. And also, we're going to have access to both winning and losing teams. Heinz Ward will be the coach of the the Roughnecks, and th that will be something great for me to go ahead and catch up with Heinz Ward, along with the Orlando Guardians. It's going to be a fantastic event Sunday at 4 o'clock, for those who are wondering. But I am a believer of XFL. I do think <laughs> it is going to make it, and let me explain to you why. 
I love what I saw for the first two games. The production I thought was phenomenal for the first two games of the season. The first game of the season, then I saw game two, which was Thursday night. But I love what they're doing. They're not copying the NFL. They have, you know, one, two, or three-point conversions that you can make at the goal line, which is exciting. They have a great mix of fan interaction. I love what they're doing. And they're, it's more serious football. The tone of it is more serious football. I felt when Vince McMahon was doing it, he was making it definitely, you know, spicy and engaging. But I think he got away from the fact that you need to have some serious content. I did misspoke, by the way, it's the San Antonio Brahmas that are coming in this Sunday. The Roughnecks was the first game they had, yeah. which um, was, was game one. So it's the San Antonio Baramas, and that's going to be Heinz Ward and crew that's coming in on Sunday. And we will be at that game. We will get coverage for, you know, both the winning and losing teams. So that's both teams. We're going to have clubhouse access. It'll be my first time at an XFL game, number one. And it'll be my first time at an Expo game where I'm covering number two. So I'm going to kind of wean my way and, and we're going to make it happen. We're going to get the insight. I appreciate all of the Expo players that are already following our show on Instagram. That seemed like the thing, the newer guys, they like Instagram it took me a while to fall in love with Instagram, but I've, I'm getting there. But yes, <laughs> even though they don't particularly follow Facebook, a lot of the players are following us on Instagram. And I appreciate them, the Expo players. I appreciate their support. They look forward to our interviews because they look for it to be dropped. I, I cannot express that anymore. So we've become like the go-to of the XFL we are, let me tell you, I am a believer in XFL. I do believe it's going to work this time. I love what I saw in the first game, 24,000 plus people that showed up to the game for the Guardians when they played away. I mean, that is a, that's an outstanding 24,000 plus people to show up at a game. Even the players were surprised that that many people showed up for game one of a reboot times three. But I do think it's going to work because I love what they're doing. I love the production. They're giving you something different than the NFL. And it is more professional football, I believe, in all ways. That the players, the way they carry themselves, it's almost like NFL-like, but it's not. I love what I'm seeing. I think it's going to work. Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia, and Jerry Cardinal, I love what you guys are doing. Can't wait to meet you, you know, this Sunday. And it's going to be fantastic. I, I, I'm a believer in XFL. And one thing I will say this much about the fans, we did not jump on a bandwagon here at the Allen and Aaron Sports at Radio Show. We jumped on it as soon as it started. There may have been, there was a press conference. It was literally just me, the coach, and one other media outlet. That's it. Now it's about six or seven that are showing up but we were there when there was only just me, the coach, and one other person. That's it. So we didn't jump on nobody's bandwagon. I believe in XFL, <laughs> and I know it's going to work. <laughs> Even with the doubters, I believe it's going to work this time around. I love what they're doing. It's moving in the right direction. Like you said, to your point, Aaron, they're not starting off so big, which is good. They're kind of nurturing this along. And I, that's the way you want to be because – like Danny Garcia said, it, you know, no matter who you are, it's hard for you to sell out as soon as a new league is started. That's just how it goes. But they're doing great. I'm curious to see the atmosphere and the turnout this Sunday in Orlando. I don't, I, even if it's not as big as you hoped it would be, I still am curious just to, to be there to see how it is. Big things coming on for the XFL. And I want to thank the XFL for giving us the Allen Aaron Sports Greater Show not only media access, but giving us the opportunity to show you what we could do as a media outlet. So let me give them a round of applause for everything they do there at the XFL. Let me do that for you right now. And just some boxing news. I did want to say I am glad that this fight is happening. 
the Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury fight, which is happening this weekend, tomorrow. I am so glad that it's finally coming through to fruition. This fight has been delayed two times. It's long overdue. And I'm glad that they are fighting in Saudi Arabia, but they are going to be fighting once and for all. I still stick with my prediction I've had from from way back yonder. I predict Jake Paul to win this fight against Tommy Fury. I really do. I know everybody wants Jake Paul to lose, but I've been saying a long time, this is the first time Jake Paul is actually fighting a real boxer. I'm not too impressed with Tommy Fury. I He just doesn't come across as too confident in his own skill. Both of the times that the fights were not made was was because of Tommy Fury not holding his end of the bargain. Tommy Fury didn't show up to the first press conference in this fight. I just feel as if this guy's not as confident in his own ability, but yet he does want the big payday. I think Jake Paul is taking it seriously. I have Jake Paul winning his first fight as far as against a professional against Tommy Fury this weekend. That is my prediction, and I would not be surprised if it was in a knockout fashion either. I really would not. I think Jake Paul puts in the work, whether you love him or hate him. Yes, he can sometimes, I can see where somebody might be irritated, but really Jake Paul is a guy who's a big-time YouTuber. He's getting a lot more money than most, most pro boxers would get at this point in their career by far, but the guy knows how to promote and market. And besides that, he puts in the work. I got Jake Paul winning against Tommy Fury this weekend. And we'll see how it turns out. That's really all the boxing news I have for you guys. Make sure you tune in and watch that fight this weekend to see if this prediction is going to be correct, which I believe it will be. I have Tommy, I have Jake Paul winning the fight by a knockout or unanimous decision. But that's who I have winning the fight, Jake Paul. And... I am so blessed to be part of the Allen and Aaron Sports Radio Show. I got to thank you guys, the listeners and the fans, for all your support, your likes, follows, and comments. If you haven't done so already, please follow us on Facebook at Allen and Aaron or follow us at our YouTube page, Allen Alford. Just type in Allen Alford. It'll come right up. And I am proud to be a part of this show. What are your thoughts, Aaron? Oh, absolutely. As we go into our fourth year now, we just uh, just about completed our third year. Um, I'll tell you what, man, uh, from where we started to where we are now is uh, is a big, big, big journey, and uh, we've had a lot of fun along the way, and there is uh, a lot more to come. We've just scratched the surface. I think we'll see a lot of other great things as time moves forward. So I want to thank again our great sponsor, Chef G's Florida Barbecue Sauce, so delicious and addicting. You may need a support group. Also, our great guest here tonight that was uh, uh, on at the top of the program. That was Anthony, Anthony Bristol. Bristol. Yeah, Anthony mm-hmm. Bristol. And then, of course, our frequent caller, Lou, for uh, for chiming in here uh, as well. So um, thank you, everybody, for listening in tonight. Thank you for, uh, for liking our content on all of our social media pages. And I want to say to everybody, have a great week. We thank you so much for your support. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Evan Aaron Sports Talk Podcast. <laughs> Subscribe and check us out on your favorite social media platform. Thank you.
accountant for variety Chef cheese, Florida barbecue sauce A natural flavor Chef cheese, Florida barbecue sauce Florida gold honey mustard On burgers and ribs Tasty fusion on pork and sausage Classic taste for chicken steak tips A hot heat wave on meatballs and ham It's a cookout treat Chef cheese, Florida barbecue sauce Serve on fish and vegetables Chef cheese, Florida barbecue sauce Chef Cheese, Florida Barbecue Sauce. Chef Cheese, Florida Barbecue Sauce.